Okay, so what we're gonna do first today is we're gonna do uh, tissue repair. And at the end of class, we can do nervous tissue, which is the fourth and final tissue type. It will take less than five minutes. Nervous tissue is the easiest of the four tissues. Epithelial, connective, muscle, nervous. But let's get to tissue repair first. So I met half of you raised your hand when I asked you if you have a scar. Um, I'm going to tell you why a scar formed. And for others, let's say that you're feeding your dog and you cut your thumb on the dog food can and it healed for a little while and it was totally gone. What would allow a scar to happen versus no scar? I'll get into that. But this is a very simple diagram of your skin. And next unit starting Friday we start the integumentary system. You're gonna be seeing this a whole lot. Well, this layer here is the top layer of your skin. Scout, what's that called? I'm looking at it right now. It's on your face, on your legs, on your hands. Epidermis. Now, here comes the big question. What type of tissue makes up the epidermis? Try it. You are correct. It is epithelial cells. Now, can we get more specific? What kind of epithelial tissue? Nailed it. This is stratified squamous epithelium. I love the participation. No shyness in here. I will find you. So speak up. Stratified squamous epithelium. Very good. Now, from here down to here, we have the second layer of skin. This is where you have blood flow, which, is, which means it is vascular. Uh, you have nerves, which means it is innervated. I'll be showing you a, a lot better examples of this as we go, but this is your dermis. If you wanna get a tattoo later in life, this is where they put it. The type of tissue that makes up your dermis, you will need to know in two days. This is connected tissue, but to be more specific, it is irregular, dense, connective tissue. If you sustain a second degree burn, it would get down to this layer. And what does that third layer look like to you guys? The yellow stuff? That's your fat. That goes by two names. Uh, you can call it the hypodermis. Remember, hypo means below, or you could just call it the subcutaneous. I'm going to call it subcutaneous. Cutaneous means skin. Subcutaneous means below it. This is mainly fat. What type of tissue is fat? Lillian, I've heard enough from you. Can you stop being a ball hog here and share the wealth? I'm just kidding. I wish everybody participated like you. Hannah, it is adipose. Lillian, I'm not really sick of you. Okay. Adipose tissue. There you go. So these are your three main layers of skin. Now, hold on. There's a big wound in that skin. That can't be good. Mm, Chris, what layer of skin has this wound penetrated? The dermis. Now, everybody, depending on where in your body we're talking about, the epidermis can be thin, the epidermis can be thick, the dermis can be thin, and the dermis can be thick. Like in your fingertips, very thin. That's why it's just a little, little cut and you'll bleed. You have a lot of nerve endings in your fingers. I mean, we, we do this. We have to be able to feel things. When you are wandering in the dark, what's, the first, what's leading your way? your hands. They're very sensitive. But in other places like your arm, the dermis is thicker. So whenever, if you for one or another, oh, is this going to leave a scar? The deeper, the more likely. If you sustained a um, cut right here, probably not a scar. Probably not. If you got one down here, that's a better chance. That's going to be, that means an injury had to go Instead of down here, I had to go way down in there. And so uh, when I got cut by this bed frame, it bled a lot, which I, it hit a pretty good blood vessel in my arm. 
And I know that it was down in my dermis because I bled. If I scraped my epidermis last week for you guys with a paperclip, I didn't bleed. There's no blood flow really in your epidermis. But I bled a lot when this bed frame cut me. So I knew, you know, this is deep. And because I wanted a scar being weird, I didn't clean it. I didn't dress it, didn't do anything. Just, you know, I, I washed it, but I didn't want to cover it up because I wanted it to heal naturally. When your body is healing, is it worried about looks or is it worried about efficiency? Absolutely efficiency. If you want looks, go to a plastic surgeon. If you just want to cl close the wound, your body is going to close it. It might not be attractive and beauty is in the eye of the holder, but um, it's going to get the job done. Okay. So let's get into how tissue repair actually happens and um, the stages of tissue repair and what's taking place to go from damaged tissue to all better again. Yeah. Your fat, uh, it'd be pretty deep. And if you wanted to spread it apart, you would actually see white and yellow tissue. Um, it will probably bleed a lot. And yeah, it would, it would be pretty deep. I'd say maybe like an inch deep. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty big. Um, I will show you burns that burned away the entire dermis and the entire epidermis where you will see just fat and muscle and bone. You ready for that? Hmm? That was a preview. That's not the real attraction. You just wait. All right. So tissue repair. I hope everyone's turning to page 142, 143. Um, the body has three levels of defense. Against invading pathogens. Now, there will be a time where we do the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system, uh, for the most part, is your immune system. And I will go into all three levels of defense for your immunity. What was that? Oh. Uh, I will get into all three levels of defense when we get to immunity. But for now, for our purposes today, I'm only going to talk about the first level of defense. Before I do get to that, my first two anatomy classes have, for the most part, been striking out. Let's see if you guys might be able to help out here. What is a pathogen? A virus is a type of pathogen. Lillian? If I put a piece of popcorn in my arm when it's ripped open, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a pathogen. It is a foreign body, but it's a specific type of foreign body. Bacteria is another type of pathogen. A pathogen in, is an infectious agent. Something that infects you. Viruses, Eva, you were right. Benny, you were right with um, bacteria, fungi, parasites. Those are all pathogens. Pathogens are basically disease. Like if you wanted to study pathology, you study diseases. We have a natural built-in defense against contracting pathogens. It's called your immune system. But your immune system also uses other systems to help it out. And the first level of defense are called barriers to entry. I don't know if you, how, how close you guys pay attention to current events. I'm sure you hear a thing or two, but you probably don't watch the news or everything like your parents do. Well, I do. And um, I try to convey some of the sciencey topics to you guys. And one thing that is a little bit concerning is out in St. Pete Beach, Clearwater Beach, there's been one or two people that have actually contracted something called necrotizing fasciitis, otherwise known as flesh-eating bacteria. They were swimming in the Gulf of Mexico and they, they got it but they have skin, skin protects you from that kind of stuff. So how do they contract it? What do you think? Well, yeah. they had a cut, they had an open wound. It's basically like leaving the door open in your house. Just come on in, raccoons come in, burglars come in, zombies come in, you gotta lock the doors. You gotta make sure everything's shut. So 
Your first layer, your first level defense is called barriers to entry. This includes your skin all over your body, it includes mucus, like up your nose and um, in your airways. Bacteria can actually like literally get stuck in your mucus, kind of like getting stuck in the mud. And then you sneeze it out or you cough it out. The cilia, remember we, last week we spoke, or a couple weeks ago, we spoke about ciliated cells in your airways. This is in your upper respiratory tract. These little tiny microscopic hair-like structures can catch things like pollen and dander and maybe bacteria or viruses and catch them and then you cough them or spit them out again. And then let's say that you have a, you're having a bag of Doritos and you drop a Dorito on the floor and you go, oh, five second rule, pick it up, you eat it. There's probably bacteria on that Dorito. You eat the Dorito, bacteria is now in your stomach, but you have stomach acid. Does your skin, your mucus, your cilia, and your stomach acid care what kind of pathogen it is? They don't. This is called non-specific defense. If I walked in the bathroom right now and caught a kid vaping, I don't care what his name is. I probably don't know his name. The fact that he's doing something wrong is what I'm concerned about. I'm not going to say, oh, Jax, he's vaping. Got him. When, if you're speeding, the cops don't go, oh, that was scout speeding. All right. Go after it. That's not how it works. This is called non-specific defense, where the barrier to entry or the defense mechanism that we have doesn't care if you're a staph infection, which is bacteria. It doesn't care if you're a COVID virus. It doesn't care if you are a athlete's foot fungi. It doesn't care. The point is stay out. That's the point. So this is all called non-specific defense. It doesn't matter what it is. It shouldn't be in the body. Well, unfortunately, throughout our lives, these barriers to entry can be penetrated or breached. And we have to have a second and third layer of defense, which we'll get to later in the year. But we're going to talk about how do you heal that breach. That's the point of today. We're not going to talk about how your body fights off this disease. We're going to talk about how do you close the hole in, the, in your body. So when any of these is penetrated, or if you want to say breached, the body's um, inflammatory. And immune <clears throat> responses are stimulated. And the, the one I really want to focus on with you all is the inflammatory response. That's what I'm going to be focusing on. Immunity will be second semester, I think. Yeah, second semester. So we have a ways to go. But we're going to talk about how do you heal that wound? Doors open, lock it. Tree just broke your window. You got to get a new window. Board it up. So in the inflammatory response, here's a few signs. Imagine that you are uh, just walking in your house and a rogue nail sticking out the wall just comes out and gets you and cuts you open and you start bleeding. You're like, ah, what the? Mm. You're know, like bleeding, rolling up your sleeve. I don't want to get blood on my shirt. You have an open wound now. So what all is happening microscopically in your skin at that time? Well, here's the first thing. Inflammatory response chemicals are secreted. These are called, um, they're not cytokines. It's on the tip of my tongue. <sighs> They'll come to me when I'm not thinking of it. For now, we'll just call them inflammatory response chemicals. It's, I'm having a brain fart. Um, you don't need to know them yet, but they're secreted. And what they do is they cause blood vessels to dilate.
Does dilate mean to get wider or get thinner? Wider. If I took a flashlight like a police officer and shine them in your eye, your pupil is going to go from this, look at me, to this. Because your eyes are trying to restrict the amount of light going in. So if this is before, if this is a blood vessel before, dilation, here's after. Now, they really stretch out. They actually become leaky. They become leaky. Things can actually leak out of your blood because they're so stretched out. What are these things that are leaky? This uh, allows white blood cells to come into the area. Now, let's say that you just scraped your arm on this nail. This might have been a rusty nail. There's definitely bacteria in that nail. You have bacteria in your arm now. White blood cells are going to find those bacteria and try to kill all of them. Next, the increased blood flow is going to bring platelets to the area. Anybody know what platelets do? We mentioned them on Thursday when we did connective tissue. Do you remember what platelets do in your blood? Lillian? They cause clotting. They, cause clotting. they basically help your blood stop bleeding. They clot your blood, helps form a scab. And then we're just going to have general fluids there. They're going to come to your body. So these blood vessels dilate and they're bringing a lot more blood flow. And in that blood flow, you're going to have white blood cells, platelets, and fluids. The healing process has almost begun immediately. This is like damage control right now. You have to clean up the area before you can rebuild. If one of your houses completely collapsed, you can't just start building a new house. You have to clean it all up first, and then you start building. Yes. Yes. All right. So another sign of the inflammatory response is pain. And I'd like to see if you all might be able to put two and two together. This blood, these blood vessels are, are dilating. They're swelling up. What else could be in the neighborhood of this blood vessel that could cause pain? It could trigger a pain sensation, a nerve ending. Your blood, check this out. Let me try to draw it for you. So everybody, this is a blood vessel. This is normal, okay? And then let's say this green thing is a nerve. It's a pain receptor. As it stands right now, is this blood vessel touching the nerve? No. But let's say that the blood vessel dilates. Now it is. And that pushing out of the blood vessel has basically tripped the nerve. And that's pain. Another sign is redness. This should be self-explanatory because your blood is red. You have a lot of blood flow in this area. It's going to be red. And warmness. You have, again, you have a lot of blood flow. Your body temperature is 98.6. Your blood is 98.6 degrees. Eva, you ever wonder why if you were to stand outside in 98.6 degrees, you would definitely be hot and sweaty. But when the blood in your body and your body temperature is 98.6, you don't feel that way? Whoa. Well, you should think about it. Okay. So this is generally the, the, the signs that you are experiencing in inflammatory response. This is the first step in healing a wound. You have to do damage control, clean out the bacteria, clot the blood, and um, have nourishing blood there to try to start to heal the wound. Well, there's two main types of tissue repair. Two ways to do it. One, regeneration. Isabella, you're going to go running on base run today and you're going to trip, trip because you're a clumsy oaf and you're going to skin your knee. And when we say you skin your knee, you damaged the skin on your knee. So Isabella, your knee is going to go through the healing process. What type of tissue do you want healing your knee? Knee tissue. 
I mean, fair enough. The tissue that was there before, right? The tissue that was there before. I have a student in my fifth period. She hurt her knee a year ago doing gymnastics. Uh, that's cartilage. She hurt her cartilage. I would want cartilage tissue to be where it was. I mean, that should make sense. If I have a flat tire, I want to replace it with a tire, not a cinder block. You want what was there originally, and that's regeneration. You replace the destroyed tissue with the same kind of tissue that was already there. Then here's the other alternative. What if you can't have it just the way it was? We call this fibrosis. If you wanna really sound smart, later in your lives, if you guys have to get surgery, whether it's cosmetic or if it's like an essential surgery, your cosmetic, I wanna get a nose job or I want to get some lipo or whatever the case is. <laughs> um, ask your doctor, what type of fibrosis can I expect? during my recovery. And they're going to be like, oh, oh, you want to talk on that level? Fibrosis is basically the formation of scar tissue from a lot of collagen. So this is replacing destroyed tissue with scar tissue. Now, what, what exactly is scar tissue? Scar tissue is dense connective tissue and collagen. Collagen was like Spider-Man's webs in that video we opened class with. And Lillian, what type of cells make up dense connective tissue? Fibroblasts, that is right. You're gonna have a lot of fibroblasts. Think about it, fibroblasts can lead to fibrosis. Makes sense to me. This tissue is gonna be really hard, harder than the tissue around it that's normal and not damaged. Um, it's probably gonna be a different color than your skin and it's probably going to not be very elastic. So if I can go back up here for a moment, let me tell you why it's a different color. This layer right here, guys, that is your basement membrane where your epidermis meets your dermis. That's where your skin color comes from. Well, if you look in this wound area right here, your skin color cells called melanocytes are gone. They're gone. And if they don't grow back, you're basically not gonna have pigment there. And this scar I have, I can easily find it because it's white, like paper white, it's right there. My skin color cells, which are called melanocytes are, are not there anymore because during the healing process, all of this um, got filled in with collagen and fibroblasts. And so all the surrounding area is my normal skin color, but not right there. That's how I can easily find it because it's a different color. There's no more skin color in that area because they were destroyed and they didn't grow back. My body wasn't preoccupied with, oh, let's make sure that the skin color comes back all the way. Well, no, it's like, let's make sure the hole is closed. That's what it cares about. We don't want to get disease. We don't want to get pathogens inside. Close the hole. Okay. So... <clears throat> On the next video, I'm going to go over the three steps for the um, tissue repair process. And then we're going to talk about what types of tissue generally heal well, heal moderately, heal poorly, and don't really heal at all.